What is going on, everybody? Welcome to Five Rounds today here on FN. Uh, I'm John Ramdean. He is Robin Black. Coming up Saturday night, UFC 185 goes down from Dallas, Texas at the American Airlines Center. The UFC's lightweight championship of the world on the line. Uh, Anthony Pettis, one of the most spectacular fighters in mixed martial arts, taking on uh, what seems to be an underrated fighter, but not, not really right now because... Uh, a lot of people believe that this is the guy that could shake things up and become the new lightweight champion. And I don't know if I'm sold. I like the idea yeah. because, you know, right now, Anthony Pettis has just seems so dominant. And as much as I love dominant champions, you always want to see some sort of competition. Yeah, I don't know. This one's weird because uh, you usually, I mean, believe you know what's really going on. But you're wrong sometimes. I mean... Ronda Rousey was going to beat Kat Zingano in a minute. I said it all week. My job, uh, pre, you know, we're on the preview show and we're on, you know, five rounds and we're on stuff. And it, to some degree, some people think their job is to, like, get people excited. I think I get people excited just because I'm excited. Yeah. It doesn't mean lie to them. And if I was asked, I said, Ronda Rousey will probably beat her in the first round. She'll either knock her out or armbar her in the first round. That's what's going to happen. That's what happened. Yeah. I didn't think... I don't feel any innate need to convince the audience that it's competitive. Yeah. But when it is competitive, that's cool. In this case, three weeks ago, I was like, Anthony's too good. He's just so good. What do you, when you looked at how he beat Gil and Melendez on paper was the guy that had the right combination mm -hmm. of things, the drive and the grit and that never say die attitude and, when, and, and push and push and push. Say, I don't mean to cut you off. The grit, when you specifically talk about the grit, it's that dirty style. Yeah. When I say dirty, yeah. of just mm -hmm. put this fight on the ground, yeah. grind it, yeah. make it physical, mm -hmm. make Anthony Pettis work for yeah. 25 full yeah. minutes. If you can implement that game yeah. plan, I could see yeah. how that would work. Yeah, and I mean, Pettis lost a split decision to Bart Palachewski, who, who uh, when he was on, he was on. Yeah. And uh, I think he started his career 0-4 and, and then, you know, became a great fighter at the end of his career. You know, wasn't competing at the highest level, but he's legit. Yeah. And Clay Guida, who did wet blanket him for 15 minutes. So the wet blanket, maybe, you know, that's not... Sure. And when a guy knocks people out to, with shots to the liver, kicks to the face insane striking wet blanket is a good idea yeah. so that made sense a safe option yeah yeah made sense and uh, also gritty as in i'm going to take a couple off the mm -hmm, side of the mm -hmm, head and mm -hmm. the top of the head to get in on your hips and that didn't work out and uh so then you it know, did you, work out in the first round it did yeah it did but even though you might have given gill the first round he hit the red line through that whole yeah. round anthony got up as quick as he was taken yeah. down and he looked really good positionally against the fence so you're like, man, this guy just literally knocking out guy after guy after guy in the first round, submitting Ben Henderson, who was almost unsubmittable, yeah. knocking out uh, Cowboy Cerrone. I mean, was there anything tougher than Cowboy oh, Cerrone? Shot to the body yeah. and he couldn't move. Uh, Joe Lozon just yeah. like, done deal. And uh, against Gilbert Melendez, any single moment of space, you looked and he, Gil looked like he was in a panic mode because there's times in a fight where you should panic. Right. You know, you should panic. Oh, my God, the guy's choking me. I, I need to panic. You know, we saw Josh Kostick panic in that moment. Like, th And there are times you should panic. For whatever reason, the second you see Anthony Pettis, whether it's body language, the way he moves, what you know about him, what, you're, what your brain is telling you, you panic a bit. And he should have panicked. Because he's the alpha male. He's yeah. got his chest puffed out. Yeah. And, the you know, swagger. The swagger. Yeah. And, you know, we've talked to trainers all over the spectrum uh, including the trainer of the former of the current middleweight champion Chris Weidman Ray Longo and he talks about confidence and false mm -hmm. confidence yeah. where some guys are pumping up the tires to make their opponents mm -hmm. believe that they're they are they fully believe yeah. that they're going to go in there and yeah. destroy their opponent but Anthony Pettis, that's not fake yeah. you feel that yeah. that is real yeah. confidence that I yeah. am coming to take yeah. you out I, he has a girlfriend or a wife, I can't remember which, but Anthony Pettis walks into a room and it's like, I'm going to smash any of you guys and then I'm going to take your girls. <laughs> yeah. That's the vibe yeah. that he not only gives off, but wears, has, you know, and uh, and he probably did that at different times in his life as a young man. Uh, but uh, that's real. I also I do a Mentality of Combat Sports podcast with David Mullins, who's a sports psychology consultant for SBG Ireland. And uh, he, we talked about confidence, the clinical definition. What are the pillars that make real confidence and fake confidence? It's real. It's an aspect of fighting. And you can see it from McGregor, Weidman, Rousey, Pettis. Yeah. And you see how important it is because I just named champions. Yeah. Um, 
But the other guy's confident too, and Rafael Desanos is absolutely confident. But you, so you look at the skills and how they break down, and you start saying, "How?" C-? And Dosanos is like, "I see holes in his game, and I have the tools to beat him." He doesn't say what they are. Mm-hmm. Which, well, he shouldn't. No, which you he know, shouldn't. because you know, is there knowing that? Like, let's just say that that's out there today. Rafael Desanos goes out and says, mm-hmm. "Okay, these are the holes that I see, and we have less than a week." Duke Rufus hears it and it's like, whoa, whoa, actually, yeah. we, we didn't yeah. realize yeah. that he... Oh, he says that his left hand comes down, which yeah. it doesn't. But if it... Oh, well, let's take a look. Does he have Damn enough time yeah. to make those amends? I talked to Duke and I started the conversation with that uh, because on the Black Eye on our previous show this week in Canada, I'm doing, focusing on what they, these things could be. What, what could Dos Anjos be looking at and is it real? And so I, I mentioned that to Duke, and he's like, well, you know, we expect he may come out with some heavy leg kicks, but we're not Nate Diaz. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's probably no disrespect to Nate but Diaz. But Dos also knows that. Yeah. They, yes. they know yeah. that Anthony Pettis yeah. is definitely yeah. not Nathan yeah. Diaz. Yeah, exactly. Nathan Diaz is heavy on the front leg with a heavy boxing, uh, you know, knee over the yeah. foot boxing style that – is susceptible to that, and that's real, and it's happened to his brother, and they live by that because it also tough. yeah, no, get tough, really. and it also allows them those insane volume yeah. punches that if they get you moving backwards or you can't kick, it doesn't work. So they're like, yeah, I mean, but we're happy to play leg kicky, leg kicky with him, this Anthony Pettis, since that makes sense, and they're like, you know, pressure. Well, I mean, if he wants to strike with Anthony, with Anthony backing up, Duke went on to say that in in MMA. If you don't consistently develop that ability, that stomp, uh, uppercut, stomp, st- straight right or left, depending on which side you're on, you're in a lot of trouble because one day you won't be able to push the other man back mm-hmm. for a variety of reasons. You better be able to fight backing up. And they're, they are more than confident Anthony can do that. And they're like, you know, against the cage or on the ground, when I study uh, Dos Anjos, and I've started that process for the uh, show Saturday, he sure as hell is good inside your guard. Mm-hmm. Pressure passing you up against ground striking. What's the best way for that not to happen? Don't get taken down. And they believe Gill is a better wrestler than RDA. And uh, so that, that Anthony's prepared for that. But my friend Evan, uh, Evan Boris, who trains uh, with under Henry Hooft and is a top uh, striking coach, said the big difference is that Dos Anjos doesn't leave space in between his wrestling. So he pushes. Gill is huge hooks to your hips yeah, right, and drive. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Dos Anjos will alternate up and down yeah, in, right, in right, combinations right. to your hips, back out, and you are in danger on his entry and especially on his exit. When when Dos Anjos leaves a clinch situation, he always strikes in combination on the way out, whether you're going to hit him or not. Always, every single time. That will change how you react as a fighter. If you get tagged two or three times on the separation, on the exit, you must address that. So anytime he exits you, you have to be either defensive or take risks and counter-strike. Though that issue, Evan Boris, believes is a problem for Anthony Pettis. I don't necessarily believe so. Duke doesn't believe so, which he shouldn't. He's his coach. He needs to believe in him. Uh, but it's going to be his, this whole thing makes it very interesting for me. A uh, really uh, solid card from top to bottom. Anthony Pettis, uh, Rafael Dos Anjos, the lightweight championship, as we mentioned before. Carla Sparza looking to defend her 115-pound championship. Johnny Hendricks, Matt Brown, Alistair Overeem, Roy Nelson, our buddy Sam Stout taking on Ross Pearson and what is just yeah. going to be a sensational throw down uh, Darren Crookshank on there. There's a couple of fighters I want to talk about. Uh, Joseph Duffy making yeah. his UFC debut. Uh, the former Olympian Henry Ciuto uh, back in competition. And Sergio Pettis, the younger yeah. brother of uh, Anthony Pettis, as we mentioned, in the main event. And what's great about it is uh, being a little bit nostalgic. Uh, you and I had the great fortune to call Sergio Pettis' yeah. first fight yeah. in mixed martial arts for the CFC uh, out of Winnipeg, Manitoba, a promotion that, you know, really helped establish mixed martial arts yep. across this country. We, we understand the importance of the UFC. It's mm-hmm. the big show. All these guys, the goal is to get into the big show to make the money. Yep. I'm here to be a professional athlete. But 
you can't get there unless you have the the support system yeah. and the CFC, just like Instinct and TKO yeah. and the MFC yeah. and all these different yeah. in Canada. You can look across. We mentioned America. There's the same exactly. In Titan Japan, RFA. The same. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, Joseph Duffy coming from the Cage Warriors yeah. organization, one of the most important mixed martial arts organizations uh, in the world in because the of, in, in the UK, but really in the world in the yeah. grand scheme of things because Conor McGregor came yeah. from that from there. Uh, Ashlyn Daly came yeah. from there. Lots of fighters mm-hmm. came from the Cage Warriors organization. Uh, but did you expect when we called Sergio's first fight that he would eventually make his way to the UFC? Now 12-1, and one, mm-hmm. I believe. Yeah. Because it doesn't always work that way. Yeah. I know uh, you look at Joe Ellenberger and Jake Ellenberger. Yeah. They're not the same fighter no. at all. Not no. even remotely close. Yeah. Jake Ellenberger, in my opinion, far more talented than Joe. But you talk yeah. to Joe who says that, or to talk to Jake who says Joe is a better wrestler, wrestler than he yeah. was. Yeah, I, I did kind of expect it. The really cool thing about the sport is there's this sort of extended family collection connection. You know, if this thing gives this thing a black belt, they're they become connected. Right. And these guys' students are connected to that. The CFC in Winnipeg is, was run by Jesse Den- or, um, Giuseppe G- Denatale. He'll yeah. kill me. You, yeah. you get this guy's name wrong. <laughs> yeah. murder you. Literally, we love him. murder you. you. Never find your body. Nobody K- will K-1 find your veteran. body. K1 veteran. K1 Grand Prix heavyweight right. champion. Uh, Giuseppe Denatale, who is a straight descendant of Duke Rufus's. And then Marc-Andre Drolet, who is one of the pioneers of the Canadian uh, MMA world. He was my manager. He was the best man at my wedding. Uh, and so you kind of get connected connected to that world. And I think for Sergio, fighting, he didn't know Giuseppe much of his life, fighting on a show up in Canada with an extended family. This is part of the show. This is part of the game, too. Yeah, you right. end up, you know, who are you going to hire to fight on your shows? Well, people you like, people you have relationships with, fighters that you know, good fighters, good coaches, you know. So there was going up to Winnipeg there. It was a comfortable place. I think he was 17, wasn't he? He was young. He was young, He man. was young. Uh, and he looked very good. He fought a, a young man uh, in his debut that people wanted me to fight often. Yeah. Kyle uh, Vivian. Kyle Vivian. Yeah. Um, Kyle Vivian was, I think, he ended up like 0-7 or something. Yeah. But he was the most dangerous 0-3 oh, yeah. guy. Fought Eamon Zahabi Yeah, he well. fought Eamon Zahabi because he's heavy, heavy, heavy-handed yeah. and, and uh, powerful, compact. And it's like, so great. You're fighting an 0-3 guy who's a risk to you. It's not like you fight a 3-0 and guy, you take a loss early in your career. Well, I fought a good guy. You fight a guy that people who don't know think he's not very right. good. So uh, he fought a, 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 and he head kicked him and he looked slick. Yeah. And Duke was sitting next to me and I, next to us yeah. as we commentated it. And we said, uh, how's he going to turn out? He said, pure skill-wise, he's better than Anthony, I mm-hmm. think. Pure gift-wise, he's also watched his brother. I think Dave Zaninga fought on yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, great yeah. kickboxer. Uh, we're going yeah. to come back. We're going to talk about uh, the roots of mixed martial arts around the world, but here in Canada, and our, our affiliation to some of the athletes on the card. But five rounds today continue. Back to five rounds today. UFC 185 goes down Saturday night. Uh, we're looking at some of the guys on the undercard. Mm-hmm. Uh, specifically, uh, Anthony Pettis' younger brother, Sergio Pettis, also Joseph Duffy, uh, who made his career fighting for the Cage Warriors organization, which you can see here on FN. And don't forget, leading into UFC 185, you can catch our preview show that starts at 7 p.m. and then immediately following the pay-per-view Tune back into Fight Network for our post show, which includes the post fight press conference. Everybody wants to hear what Dana White has to yeah. say. Uh, but we're talking about the roots of MMA. Uh, specifically, we're talking about the CFC, Sergio mm-hmm. Pettis. We had a chance yeah. to call his first ever fight. And, you know, these organizations are very important. I mean, the CFC, uh, Jesse Ronson fought yeah. there. 
who was also made his way to the UFC, Claude Patrick, who's yeah. a UFC fighter, John McDessie. So these are organizations that are vital mm -hmm. to the health of mixed martial arts because the cream always rises to the to the top. So you see, okay, Instinct or Cage Warriors or CFC, yeah. these guys are the best. They get the experience and make their way to the UFC. Is there ever going to be a time where we just don't know who the best are because there's so many of these mixed martial arts organizations. It's tricky because it can you make money doing these? And when there's a big global powerhouse like the UFC, if there's a global powerhouse like Walmart, it's hard to go out and get into the business of competing with Walmart. Same with Apple computers. Look at Target. Same with, Target yeah. just went out of business here yeah, in, in Canada. Canada. Yeah, if you're uh, somewhere else in Can other than Canada and you have Target, we don't. We don't. They came up and they spent $100 million, yeah, dollars and then they were like, man, wow. we're losing $200 yeah. million. And so it's very hard. Um, and uh, why are we talking about this stuff? Because if there's, there's different levels of any kind of consumption, but there's different levels of fandom, and fan comes from fanatic. That's what the, where the word fan comes from. And uh, if you are just sort of kind of a fan, you're like, I like that Anderson St. Pierre fella. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if, you're, if that's you, yeah. you don't care about any of this. This yeah. ain't the podcast necessarily for you. But if you are, if this is your thing, these fighters are, are of uh, vital interest to you. The more you learn about them, you're like, well, where did they come from? Mm -hmm. Where did they get that training? Well, where did that coach get that training? And that is one of the fascinating things about this sport is it isn't like – Baseball, which is going to take you hundreds of years of historical research to figure yeah. out what, you know, who, uh, how many players did they have at first? What equipment? Was it empty hands? This thing's only, you know, it's not 20 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, depending what era of fighting you want to look at, you look back 10 years, you find some pretty yeah. vital grassroots stuff. And if you're a fan of this sport, and it's really, you find it interesting for on a number of levels, you can learn everything about it in a, in a year. Yeah, it's Just true. by spending your, um, your relaxation time, your hobby time, absorbing this stuff. And you dig deep enough, you want to know who the coaches are and who these shows are. When that awesome fighter, when he started, who did he fight and where was it? What did it smell like in there? How many people mm -hmm. were in the audience? That kind of stuff is very fascinating. Uh, speaking of which, of course, we're talking about some of the prospects and I think you and I both expect big things from Sergio Pettis. Yeah. When Anthony yeah. is, your, is your mentor mm -hmm. uh, and the guy that says, look, you have to – I have a vested interest in you because you are my flesh and blood. Mm -hmm. Do these things yeah. if you want to yeah. uh, retire by the time you're yeah. 45 yeah. years old or go on to something yeah. else or 40 years yeah. old or whatever it is yeah. from professional sports. Yeah. Duke will be the guy that guides you from yeah. this department. Yeah. Listen to us, yeah. and we will yeah. get you where you yeah. need to be. And I believe that he's yeah. one of those guys. Yeah, pressure comes with that yeah. for sure. The expectations are Anthony immense. Anthony will tell him that. Yeah. yeah, and he'll understand that. He's smooth, man. That kid is smooth and seems smart, and he's got a together and Anthony understands now what it is to be a celebrity what it is yep. to be on a you know, to, box. yeah what it is to be stalked and and to have a ton of fans in good and bad ways and and business pressures and people trying to steal money from you yep. and all that stuff that comes with it that you know you can't necessarily go party on Friday because one it's going to interfere with all of your businesses and mm -hmm. everything and two somebody's going to take a cell phone picture of you doing something somewhere yeah so they're all he has his older brother to go through all that kind of stuff uh, I want to talk about uh, the co-feature Carla Esparza uh, looking to defend her strawweight championship and I, I said it before and this this is meaning no disrespect yeah. to Carla Esparza uh, I'm not sold yet yeah. because quite frankly uh, were people talking about her when she fought Beck Rollins for the Invicta yeah. title sure maybe the I hard, watched it sure I watched the it. hardcore community is tuning into that yeah. if that's their thing but to say that she is the best 115 pound fighter in the world is not necessarily true. We don't we, we don't know. We call some pretty great 115 That's pound right. females out of Deep and Jewels That's right. over in Japan. We commentate on our network. I mean, if you watch our network, you see and, we commentate and that. Same, and same with we KSW, KSW as well. KSW. Oh man, there's a good yeah. fighter Karina over. Kowalkiewicz. Yeah, <laughs> she's good, man. She's undefeated. Yeah. And, and again, Carla Esparza also lost to Jessica Aguilar, and many people yeah. will be believe, or many people say, that she's the best yeah. 115, mm -hmm. 100, however, she's the best in yeah, her weight yeah. division. 
And same with Megumi Fuji. And Megumi Fuji, she's old school fighter. Yeah. She's one of these women that yeah. helped pioneer uh, female mixed martial yeah. arts. It started in Japan. Yeah. And she had a thing. So just like Ronda Rousey. Yeah. Well, she had the arm bar. Uh, Megumi Fuji, she was a submission master. And yeah. that's what people looked at. 20, 20 30 26, fights. 26 victories, three losses. Yeah, 19 submission wins. Yeah. So she had the it factor. What year was her first fight? Going all the way back to 2004, before yeah. the first Ultimate Fighter. Uh, look at some of the girls that she's faced. Lisa Ellis, yeah. uh, who was on the Ultimate, mm-hmm. the recent uh, season of the Ultimate Fighter. And she's taken this girl out. She beat Carla Esparza, as I mentioned. Yeah. And this girl's yeah. a very talented girl. Yeah. So to see Carla Esparza in the co-main event... Yeah, uh, I, and I'm not saying that I I dislike it. She just has to go out yeah. and put on a show. Yeah. She has to prove to the world that she really is the champion. And I think the way that she does that, she has to take it to yeah. her. Yeah, she does need to. Uh, Uriah Faber told us in an uh, uh, interview we ran on the network, and it was really he's a very, very smart guy. He gets it. He gets it. You have two options. You have to be so unbelievably great that people who love the sport itself just look up to you, yeah. see you as a brilliant genius, a brilliant artist. You have to be that great. Or you got to be a superstar. In a perfect world, you're both like Ronda Rousey or, uh, or Anthony. Uh, you have to be one or the other or both. She's not yet a star. You, she hasn't, you know, you were mm-hmm. on a TV show, but star power is something that we can't necessarily yeah. put our finger on. Nobody really can. There's out, experts out there sure. who sign pop stars and whatever, but but you can't really put your finger on it. You just don't yet have it or may never have it. So you have to be dominant, mind-blowingly dominant. The I like watching her fight. I like to fight over Beck Rollins. I like the grinding style. I like the pressure style. Somebody who's that good of a wrestler can be a great fighter. I'm going to enjoy the fight physically. I'm going to enjoy the fight artistically. My uh, thing, if while we're on the topic, she's like, oh, they, want, they aren't promoting this fight enough. They aren't promoting it. Yeah. Look, man, they're promoting it exactly the same as everything else. You Have need to, to capture apart. attention. I don't like that that's true. I wish this was all a results-oriented business. Mm-hmm. I wish this was always you know, a success-oriented business. You're the champion. But the truth is it is not. The truth is, again, again against, my, against what I believe in, it is a star power-oriented business as well. They'll put you on TV. They'll put you in the co-main event. They're not promoting it heav- heavily enough. That's on you. And when we come back, we're talking more about Carla Esparza, who co-headlines UFC 185, win five rounds today. Gentlemen, welcome to Fight Club. It's movie night every Sunday here on Fight Network as we bring you a double dose of action-packed films. I've never seen anything like this before. With two back-to-back movies every Sunday night, you can expect to see twice the explosions, twice the Schwarzenegger. I'll be back. And twice the... You're going to have to tune in for that stuff. It's the Effin' Movie Night doubleheader, and it's coming at you every Sunday at 9 p.m. Welcome back to Five Rounds Today. John Ramdeen and Robin Black with you. We're looking ahead to UFC 185. Uh, we're discussing Carla Esparza and, and what she needs to do yeah. to kind of draw attention. And we're also looking at, we're talking about the lineage. Uh, you're, you were saying before about you can trace uh, training back yeah. only 10 or 15 yeah. years because this is an experiment yeah. that's less than 20 years old. Yeah. And for Carla Esparza, the one thing that she definitely has is she has that lineage. Yeah. She, uh, Colin Oyama is her coach. She yeah. trains with uh, Uncle Creepy, mm-hmm. Ian McCall. And Colin Oyama also trained uh, Shane Del Rosario, mm-hmm. God rest his soul. And... Uh, he used to train Quentin Jackson, yeah. so he's been around yeah. this game, so she's doing the right things. Yeah. But that doesn't necessarily mean just because you're doing yeah. the right things that people are going to pay attention. Yeah, and uh, listen, I, it's, 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 it sucks that you have to go, oh, we mean no, no disrespect. Yeah. We, you don't. You're literally talking analytically about what, how, the choices someone makes. Personally, if you're not going to have whatever it is, well, and she said you know, something about maybe if I dye my hair blonde. 
you can't go play a game that you're not built to play. Mm-hmm. You know, you can't. It's like the make, trash talking game. I can't make you into what's that band your daughter likes for the British that, one? Oh, well, one, one Direction. One Direction. Yeah. I can't shoehorn you into. Do they have? Do they play instruments? Uh, Maybe. I think Let's a say they of do. Them do. Yeah. You can't be the bass player for One Direction. Right. You yeah, can't. Impossible. Like we can put a wig on you. I could be and, a studio guy. I could yeah. be, they can. <laughs> do, 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 do. But we're not going to make you the One Direction. Yeah. And it isn't your look, your yeah. age, yeah, the ability to back. smile, yeah. Yeah, the ability yeah, yeah. to say nonsense. Yeah. It's nonsense that people say in interviews and yeah. stuff. It's absolute nonsense. She's never going to be good at that. So her role is to go out and be destructive. Like George St. Pierre. Be, yeah. Be so good. Be screw talking screw impressing people screw saying the right thing on the right show at the right time because you're never going to compete that's a whole different game than fighting yeah, right. you want to be the best fighter yeah and all of this nonsense i hate it i absolutely hate it when i we were talking about duke earlier and when i called him i wanted to get his insight into those potential things that that Dos Anjos may be looking at as flaws. And I said, Duke, you know, uh, Dos Anjos the other day in the press mentioned uh, that, uh, and then I stopped myself, I'm like, Duke, you know I, I don't give a shit about what Dos Anjos said, and said, I'm not yeah. trying to get an inflammatory yeah, response yeah. for you. Tomato can journalists do that. Yeah, That's course. absolute yeah. nonsense. Like, why anybody would care yeah. that Dos Anjos said, you know, I see holes in his game, and they all go running over to yeah, him, yeah. and it's like, he said he sees holes in your game. Who gives a shit? Yeah. However, however, the, but like, to, I think for, for Mark, Martial artists, it's less about that he said it, it that it's there's a hole there. So, yeah. like, oh, okay, really? What hole yeah. is there? That's Instead the story. Of just, yeah, that's the story, opposed to, oh, he said something yeah. inflammatory. Yeah, exactly. Or he's trying well, to talk. Oh, really? Shit. He said, what about yeah, me? Yeah. Now I, say, yeah. I, I I guess people do care about that. I'm not criticizing people who care about it. But if there's, let's say there's a thousand journalists, if 940 of them are asking that same nonsense, you're directing the audience to think that's what they're supposed to care about in fighting. And it's the opposite of what they need to care about. They can if they like, mm-hmm. but let's not build that thing up that it's just a soap opera with some coincidental fighting. The reason I said that to Duke, I wanted to hear what those holes yes, right. might be, what this guy could possibly believe, and what you as a coach see whether they're there or not. Mm-hmm. Because that was the piece I was doing, is that, hey, what might be the holes that this guy perceives and are they real? And from looking at the real aspects, the art of the sport, are they really there and does he have advantages mm-hmm. there? Even saying that, I felt like a total fucking idiot. True, true but know? at the same time, like you look at... But I mean, my point was, how can these guys not feel like idiots going, did you see on Twitter he, he said this yeah, to you? Yeah, yeah. Hey, if, if 400 no, the, out of 1,000 yeah. do that, that's probably good. But if 900 out of 1,000 of them are doing that, the whole story becomes about Twitter beefs and the whole story becomes about, you know, hey man, did you hear what that guy said about you? Mm-hmm. What about the actual artistry? Like but what you, about the actual but, fight? But we've, had, we've talked about this in the past in the sense that, you know, whether you uh, live in the United States of America, uh, Football is part of your culture. Yeah. Chances are you played football since the time you yeah. were four or five. Not necessarily organized football. If you live in Canada, you played some sort of uh, form of hockey a- as a child. Mixed martial arts, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. Uh, most people that you know watch the UFC or watch MMA have not spent no. one second yeah. on the mat yeah. or hitting pads or doing yeah. any yeah. type of thing. So for them, it's like, well... All I've got is yeah. the shit talk. Yeah, yeah right. So, you know, right. I, I can't understand. It's like, okay, all I see when two guys are up against the cage, they're not doing anything. It's like, well, you don't know how yeah. physically exhausting yeah. that is yeah. as two guys all are pushing against All the strategy, if you can get the yeah. elbow to move this way, he might be, you know, yeah, I know, I know. And we try. that's why I, I was talking to Eddie Bravo, who, if you haven't seen the commercial for this guy's thing, I know we need to take yeah, a break, yeah, but we, if you haven't seen the commercial for Eddie Bravo's 10th Planet, go YouTube it. Yeah, we'll talk about that. Spectacular. Yeah, sensational. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we'll talk Bobby about Bassett. Eddie Bravo yeah. and, and all yeah. that stuff. We're going to run out of time. Yeah, yeah we're going to run out of time. But <laughs> more about uh, 185 and the whole mixed martial arts landscape. Five rounds today.
are back at it. It's five rounds today. Before the break, we were talking about coaches. We are yelling about it. We are yelling about a bunch of stuff. Uh, Eddie Bravo. And I want to talk about your point because, you know, you're saying how uh, you heard Rafael Tosanos. He had a comment. You were trying to relay it to Duke saying that this and that. But one thing you have to know, this is still a game of I'm here to protect my fighter, mm-hmm. Duke Rufus. Because if you say, look at Duke, I want you to deconstruct Anthony's mm-hmm. thing. If you're in the corner of Rafael Desanos, what are you doing yeah. to coach him to yeah. beat Anthony yeah. Pettis? And he's like, well, I can't really say that yeah. because I see Anthony every yeah. day. I know where his flaws yeah, are, right. and I know how to yeah. introduce ideas, yeah. how to beat him. Yeah. So he can only be yeah. so honest. Yeah, that's true. That is true. But there's all, that raises a whole other number of points. One being, yes, I mean, if, like, Bang Ludwig is very analytical with his guys. Yeah. And he's probably thinking, like, and a lot of these coaches are like, okay, over the next year, I got to make sure that when this guy steps left, I repair that. His hip is changing in such a way. I got to, that's what a great coach mm-hmm. is. And then over the next six months, I know I can get that to fire this way. But if I can slowly develop so that when the head slips this hand, that, that is going on in their minds. Duke definitely, when you talk to him, he's like, I'm confident because I know how ready my guys are. And Duke's good. He does television. He does Mm -hmm. calls glory and stuff. But he's not the world's best liar either. So I can kind of tell that he really is confident. And when he says Anthony has no flaws, if that was so, Anthony would never need Duke anymore. Mm -hmm. So he must have some. And you're right. And if there are some that Duke, as that sort of mind, would see, he sure as hell shouldn't tell anyone. If he told me... I'm a friend. If he said, don't tell anyone but, I probably wouldn't tell anyone. But that's not a good strategy for a coach because what if I got drunk one night and somebody yeah, asked of course. me? You know what I mean? I'm in Mexico. I'm drinking tequila and um, I tell someone. Now, for right now, Rufus Sport, a destination. Yeah. Uh, if you're a high-level mixed yeah. martial arts competitor, uh, there are a hand. I'm not going to say a handful because there's there's great gyms really all over the world. Yeah. And they keep popping up, whether it's the lab yeah. in, uh, in Arizona, yeah. whether it's Jackson's in New Mexico, TriStar in Montreal, uh, the Straight Blast Gym in Ireland, yeah. a.k.a. Yeah. I mean, American top team, yeah. so on and so top. forth. Uh, and same with uh, Rufus Sport in Milwaukee. Uh, when you look at some of the guys uh, that they have there, Anthony Pettis, Sergio Pettis, Eric Koch, Chico Camus back there, Dustin Ortiz there, uh, Rick Len, who eventually yeah. will make his way to yeah. the UFC. Yeah. For Duke as a coach, a lot of needy people on that mm-hmm. list. Mm-hmm. And you're trying to deconstruct yeah. what they're good at. It's like, okay, well, this is the curriculum. This is what we need to do. Yeah. It's like, well, these two guys aren't getting it. Yeah. Do you spend that time as a coach working yeah. with them to ensure that they're where they need to be? Or is it like, we've done this enough times. Yeah. I got to focus on the race yeah. horses. For sure. Uh, you got to do it all. Um, Chico Camus is a hot prospect, and especially as a game day performer. But there was issues with how much he trained and with how much commitment he had to the team. Oh, you don't have a fight coming up? Sergio needs you in the gym. S- you know, uh, who, what are their other uh, 125ers? They have another uh, young guy that's really, really Dustin good. Ortiz. Dustin Ortiz. Yeah. Dustin needs you in the gym, man. And he wasn't always there. And eventually they were like, you got to beat it. You got, and he, I think, pretty sure he came back. Yeah, he's back. He's back but now. that was what he had to do because, like, man, Dustin needs you. Um, Sergio needs you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I, you come in and you might, and this is, I'm paraphrasing, but you're taking, but you're not giving. I can't give you that time. Also, I got some professional wrestler who's really driven and, and uh, got a great attitude and is a really good guy and has the pressure of a first fight in the UFC. And I'm going to give him some too. And he can't be in the room with you guys yet because he's not good enough. So all of that, it, it is very interesting. The job of a coach is a crazy one. They got to be born into it. Especially to to when, it. as I mentioned before, uh, Rick Glenn, right now, 25 years of age, fights at 145 pounds with a record of 15 I'm three a huge and one. fan. Oh, I, me too. We called a couple yeah. of his fights. Yeah. Very, very entertaining fighter. Yeah. Uh, his last fight, however, a loss to Lance Palmer, who yeah. is 9-1, and one, 27 years of age, mm-hmm. uh, and he is one of the coaches at yeah. Team Alpha Male. Yeah. And as yeah. I, I was talking to TJ Dillashaw, and he's like, this guy is yeah. sensational. Yeah. So those athletes are out there. Why don't we know about them? These two guys are probably, what, that 45? They're probably better than the bottom 25 to 40% yeah. of the guys yeah. in the UFC. But it's how you play the game, too, how the business unfolds. Uh, every now and again, I talk to Sean Shelby, just friendly, yeah. and I asked him about Rick Glenn. He's like, man, he's just on a loss right now. 
I mean, I don't represent him. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, 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 I don't course. speak to, yeah, yeah, yeah. to Rick personally since we called this fights. But, you know, I, these are fun conversations to have. I don't know about this guy. So yeah, he's yeah. coming off a loss. I mean, they, they will rarely. It, you've got to have some kind of structure if you're Joe and Sean. I get it. But when yeah. you put up, it's, it's, I understand that he's coming off a loss. But when you put up his record... 15, yeah. 3, and, and he's, It's one. a loss to a guy who's and, probably uh, a legit, in the yeah. mid yeah. to uh, over mid level of all the 45ers on your roster and, already. And when you're selling Rick Glenn, you say his only loss coming to one of the coaches at Team yeah. Alpha Who he'll get. Uh, he's probably going to have his yeah. next well, fight. Well, Palmer. Word is that he's been offered a contract, yeah. but because of the whole World Series yeah, of fighting right. thing, uh, they're issue. just just trying yeah. to get all that sorted yeah. out. And right. You kind of feel bad for these mm -hmm. guys because, as, and you feel bad for the World Series yeah. of fighting because they're trying to do their best. They're trying to give people an alternative to the yeah. big show. Yeah. And, they and when they have fights like this, it's good, at, right? Anthony We're talking Rumble about Johnson yeah. fought on, yeah. on that yeah. show. So it's like if you're a fan of Anthony Didn't he Johnson, fight Arlovsky? He fought Andre Arlovsky. Arlovsky on the World Series Yeah, of there fighting. you have it. So it's like, okay, well, I've always been yeah. a fan of Anthony Rumble Johnson. He's yeah. not in the UFC. I still want to yeah, watch him fight. Sure. Where can I yeah. see him fight? The World Series of Fighting uh, offered that. So that's yeah. why I tune in. Same yeah. with Lance Palmer, and that's why Rick Glenn. Yeah. And there's so many Sergio athletes. Sergio Moraes. That's, you know, you look Is at. It Sergio? No, uh, Marlon Moraes. Marlon Moraes. Very Marais. talented. Yeah. Uh, a teammate yeah. of Frankie yeah. Edgar. Fought uh, Josh, Josh Hill, Hill who looked stunned. good. That, that's yeah. it. So there is an alternative. And what's great is that. You get to see these guys build the record, but we're seeing more and more athletes that get a 10 and 0 record mm -hmm. go to the UFC. Yeah. And people are like, well, they're 10 and 0. Yeah. They're not that, as good as either of these right. two. I Neither, know. I, know. I get it. Okay, Lance Palmer is 9 and 1. He essentially could be 10 and 0. Yeah. He's that good. Yeah. But there are so many athletes out there, whether they're coming from Brazil yeah. or Canada or wherever, that amass these big records, and people are blown away yeah. by the 10 and 0, yeah. 11 and 0. And they're just not that good. Yeah. But, I mean, these, a lot of these are just functions of machine. How machine works, how growth works, how workload works. And if you're Joe and Sean, they know, man. You talk to Joe Silva, he's a smart cat. But he's got all the fights of the year, every single show with spreadsheets, and he's got to fill holes, and Anthony Johnson's opponent just fell out, yeah. and John Jones just got injured, and big, big money, million dollar things, and all of a sudden, it's, we, we need a hole on the bottom thing. Oh, some kid, I mean, there was, uh, in, Michael Imperato is a kid from Canada. He, he, his young manager called and said, I got a 135er who's seven and one with a bunch of submissions, and Mike is a good, great fighter, but uh, he had a few background issues. issues. Yeah. They, they don't have time to look all that up, mm -hmm. so they just go and say we got a seven and one kid with a bunch of a bunch of finishes. They didn't look. Is his record? Mike is UFC caliber in my opinion, but is his record? Are the guys he beat that good? It, did you check yeah, out right. the background, which was some issues? Hopefully, he overcomes them in the future. But they just got to sign it because they got to fill in a hole on a thing. Two men doing forty two shows a year with ten fights on yeah. each in twenty different countries. It's just a function of how the machine. And plays I think out. you mentioned that uh, you t talked to Joe Silva, and he said, you know, uh, I would love to be able to, you know, scale the shows back. But right now, you're it's yeah. damage control. Yeah. Like you said, you have yeah. the spreadsheets, and it's like, oh, well, I just need an opponent yeah. for Fighter X, mm -hmm. and that's not opposed to I have my whole roster. Yeah, right. What are these dream yeah. matches? Exactly. That I can make? Well, what are the who are the best guys? Yeah. Because in the old days, yeah, those yeah. guys knew they would know more. You know, we were calling fights on the grassroots of Canada. And Joe Silva and Sean Shelby would be two people who would know, because we had to know who all these yeah, guys right. were. They'd know it like us when they were only doing seven, eight, ten shows a year. They can't now. It's not possible. If you ask Silva, Joe Silva, he would, and he would say it in a cool way, it'd be like, hey, if you asked me, I'd love to do 18 mm -hmm. shows a year. But my job is to yeah. fill shows. My job is to be the best matchmaker in the world. This is my assignment. That's what I have to do. We're talking more shit when five rounds today continue, so don't go anywhere. Hey there, fight fans. John Ramdeen joined alongside Robin Black here in our Fight Network studios, reminding you to catch five rounds every Monday at 7 Eastern. Five rounds is the most comprehensive MMA show on the planet as we focus on the whys and the hows of the MMA world. I mean, who else talks about how the kinesthetically adaptive unconscious and alpha posturing are used to gain a competitive advantage in a fight? It's five rounds every Monday at 7 Eastern, only on FN. Five rounds right here on FN, yeah!
Welcome back to Five Rounds today. John Ramdeen and Robin Black with you discussing kind of everything. Whatever we want to talk about, yeah. we talk about. Yeah. We kind of yeah. ch- steer it in whatever yeah. direction. Uh, but we got to talk about uh, March 21st. We know that uh, March 14th, the lightweight championship uh, on the line. Uh, after that, Damian Maya, Ryan LaFlair, uh, UFC fight night from Brazil. Uh, got to give it to Josh Koscheck. You know, gets submitted by Jake Ellenberger. Says, wait, 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 wait. That's not the real Josh Koscheck. I'm going to show you the real Josh Koscheck three weeks later as he takes on, um, my, f- for my money, one of the most entertaining fighters yeah. at 170 pounds. Win, lose, or draw, Eric Silva. I, uh, that's destination TV. I've got to watch this yeah. guy compete. You always hope that he makes those improvements mm-hmm. defensively. Mm-hmm. And if he makes those improvements, I think he probably can contend. But when you see what he's capable yeah. of, it's like, oh, this guy could be yeah. something good. But we've seen that before where guys yeah. just don't live up to the potential. Yeah, that ability to just explode, that destructive nature, we love watching yeah. that. Um, but with it will often come holes, you know, little slots that you can you can put your own offense into. And we called literally a KO by overhand left by Dong Young you Kim. You called it, yeah. That that was going to happen in that fight yeah. because it was there. And also we had the luxury of calling about eight or 10 Dong Young yeah. Kim fights early on. It was deep, right? Yeah, in yep. deep. And there was like six or seven le- straight left hand or overhand left KOs in a row. You got a lefty versus lefty scenario with a guy who's wide open. If you're Dong Young Kim who likes to trade, who and kind of as he went on, he was a grinder, used a lot of judo pressure. He's like, oh, I make my money just opening up. That's the perfect guy to open up on. Uh, and you're right, you look at it and it's like, you want to see them potentially close those holes. Has he fought um, Matt Brown yet? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah and he lost. And he Matt lost. Brown. That's yeah. right. He faded yeah, that's later why. on. Yeah. Go, 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 go. Because the first thought I had was, well, Matt Brown was like that at one time. Third but round, Matt Brown lost. has closed it yeah. out. But he's closed it out with this. Like, go ahead. Yeah. Hit me. I'm fine with I'm it. I'm fine with it. Old school Chuck Liddell. Like, yeah. I, if we both get four shots each in... At any time, I'm pretty sure you'll be the guy to either yeah. go down I'll or handle. start backing up. Yeah. And if you start backing up with Matt Brown, you're dead. You start backing up with Eric Silva, you're dead. So Matt Brown, Eric Silva, that's some that's some Joe Silva stuff. These are the ones where he's like, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, I got yeah, a great yeah. guy. For and that. Matt Brown, Jordan Mean was exactly yeah. Yeah, the same yeah, thing. Yeah, he's course. like, this guy just drives forward and you probably never take a step back. Oh, I got other guys like that. Yeah. And I'm, let's see what happens. And those always always come through but you're either going to go down or back up with matt brown with eric silva it was the same till he met matt and he was going with jordan it once he got hurt he had a broken orbital bone and stuff your body needs you to back up yeah yeah yeah. with silva his body also needed but fatigue caused it Mm -hmm. so will eric silva cure the fatigue issue will he cure the the fact that his offense is so exciting and he loves it so much. Yeah, That's yeah. the thing. You can see how much yeah, he yeah, loves yeah. to do it. Yeah. You know, he's driven by the desire to show off his brilliant offensive yeah. weapons. Sometimes that causes you to lose, and other times you fix that issue and you're never the same fighter. Yeah, right. You know, so we'll see. Main event, uh, Damian Maya taking on Ryan LaFlair. And if you are a real fan of mixed martial arts, you all know how dangerous Ryan LaFleur is. Yeah. And, and this is... Undefeated is, still? Undefeated yeah. 11-0. And this is one of those fights... I'm sure Damian Maya isn't thrilled about this fight. It's like, well, I know how dangerous this guy is. And right now, he has zero name yeah. value. Yeah. And if I go out there, I've got a lot of miles on mm-hmm. my, my body. This guy beats me. People think I'm a yeah. has-been. Yeah. Yeah, it's not an easy one. They offered him Sean Pearson at one yeah. time in Brazil. And Sean was like... I have a full-time job right now, and I weigh 220 pounds, <laughs> yeah. so no. Uh, and uh, it's going to cost me – that's some of the issue, too. You're Ryan LaFleur. This is a name-building fight. Yeah. Whatever you make, let's say Ryan LaFleur, is he 3-0 in the UFC, 4-0 in the UFC? If he started at 10-10, and 4-0 in the UFC? Uh, he's 4-0 in the UFC. 10-10 and 10 is 20, 12-12, and 12, he's at 44, 14-14, uh, uh, 14 and 14, he's at 60, 72,000. And 16 and 16, he's at 110, 115,000 he's brought in. So now he's at 18 and 18. So he's got 36,000 he can make potentially. Okay, we're talking about Ryan LaFleur's money. money. (laughs) We're talking about the main event of Fight Night that goes down March 21st. We're breaking down the card when we come back to five rounds today.
like Knockout. Tune in the glory of Fight Network in Canada. Are you ready for Welcome back to Five Rounds today. Next week, we are going to break into this collectible courtesy of our friends at Tops. Uh, I'm very excited to find out what's inside of this magical box. Uh, I collected hockey cards growing up, and I have a feeling there's going to be some goodies yeah, inside cool. of this card. Cool. Uh, before the break, we're talking about the Fight Night matchup. Damian Maya taking on Ryan LaFleur. Uh, you called it, this is kind of a career-making yeah. fight for Ryan LaFleur. Yeah, So, let, and we were talking about, as you put it going to the commercial, we're talking about Ryan LaFleur's money. <laughs> Let's say he even signed a new deal after four wins. He's making 20 and 20 or more. Yeah. So you got a forty thousand dollar potential. You got to pay management and coaches twenty percent. You're down to thirty six thousand. The costs of going down to Brazil, flying in a second corner, mm -hmm. hotel for a second mm -hmm. corner, extra things that you got to bring down, travel away from home expenses, take another five, six, seven thousand dollars off the top of his costs. Also hard to get sponsorship for an American guy yep. in Brazil, especially with Reebok coming along. So he's making less money, was my point, to fight the best fighter he's yeah, ever yeah, fought. Yeah. But if you go in and you can beat Damian Maia, yeah. a real guy in Brazil. in Brazil, now we go, oh shit, Ryan LaFleur, right. He's the Rick Story from before, or he's Koscheck when he was rising. Guys rise, and when you get into there, all you have to look forward to is someone even better than Damian Maia. Uh, our fighter's resourceful. You know, Ryan LaFleur, uh, as we mentioned, uh, trains at the Black Zillions camp. We know that there's lots of Brazilians there. So instead of flying out another corner, instead of having to get mm -hmm. another hotel room, you have a lot of Brazilians yeah. in the room. Yeah. Are you trying to use yeah. those connections to say, look, at, I, I want to, oh, we have a guy for you like in Brazil yeah. that is staying there. You don't have to worry about those Yeah, things. like we were talking about that extended family yeah. idea. Maybe. But some people that coach the voices that you hear Maybe. are part of the whole picture. So it depends on the individual. Ryan LaFleur it sounds like one of these guys you, when he goes into any room in the world and everyone's like, oh God, this guy's tough. Wow, this guy's good at everything. And when you watch him fight, he is good at everything. Mm -hmm. He's the full picture MMA fighter. Uh, he better be good at everything for Damian Maya, but uh, this may be one where he tests out how Damian Maya has progressed on the feet. Who knows? I like the fight. I do like the fight because Damian Maya is magic. People say that jujitsu yeah. is dead in MMA. Though. Yeah, uh, I, there's lots of examples of why it isn't, but it's certainly becoming less of the huge feature of MMA. It's certainly becoming less of the huge weapon that mm. you know you can you can't build a brand new MMA fighter around jiu-jitsu unless they are some kind of incredible badass. Can the 10th Planet system, we know Eddie Bravo has developed his jiu-jitsu mm -hmm. system for mixed martial arts. Uh, Oh, will we see more of that? Will we see more jujitsu if people kind of start ado uh, uh, adopting the Tenth Planet system? The interesting thing about that one, and we'll talk about that in future shows as well, but the fact that everybody is playing closer now. It used to be, well, you got to posture up in his guard. You barely see that. Guys are getting back to their feet, underhook back to the feet. So people play close. They go head under chin, hands in armpits. You're playing into that guard. Mm -hmm. If you, Whether you work an overhook or a, a hold the head, you can put yourself in a position in some someone's guard where they can't really hurt you. That's where you can get offensive. But we haven't yet, I mean, Ben Saunders uh, had a beautiful Loma yep. Plata, all built entirely in a hotel room on the floor next, right. next to the bed by Eddie the night before, just or at least reviewed. Uh, it's real. It's real. Uh, will he? He need, you need the great athletes to come over and believe. You need some real studs to come in and get trained by Eddie. But I believe it's real. I, I believe it'll be a huge factor. That is it for us. Uh, Next week, we are going to take a look at all the fallout from UFC 185, and then we're going to take a look back in history. We're going to discuss who some of our favorite fighters are and were, and then we're also going to dig into this box of goodies courtesy of our friend Jeremy at Tops. That is it for us. He's Robin Black. I'm John Ramdean. 